no worries whatever okay. it takes um yeah i know those conversations can turn interesting routes so <laughs> i'm not on a time limit let's put it that way yeah you're nice and relaxed you're you're not a day yeah. it's good um <laughs> Welcome to Health Odyssey, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Health Oddity podcast, episode 208. And we are with a very, very special guest today, someone who's been mentioned a number of times on the podcast uh, and someone who was mentioned most recently, I think, um, when we had uh, Andrew Russell on a few weeks back um, when he was training to lift the Dinny Stones up in Scotland. So uh, I will introduce you to him in a minute. But as I just said to him a minute ago, it, he, it's a first, well, it's two separate first for the podcast today so uh I will, I will explain that in a minute first of all i'm just going to catch up with mr peter lamp because actually our guest at the moment is on holiday and peter lamp and myself are both on holiday tomorrow although not together not, not together exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so we're on holiday tomorrow so we'll, i'm sure we'll probably talk a little bit about training on holiday and that sort of thing because especially with our with our guests because i've seen him training on holiday um anyway uh mr peter land are you okay mate i'm i'm great i'm feeling a little bit um a little bit of a fraud because we're, we're not going to be recording anything over the next two weeks because we're going on holiday and our guest just before that is he is on holiday recording this with us so it's kind of like that's commitment. We're, we're not we're not as committed as well. As no, we've we've time. got we've got set we've got uh I know, but we've you got know, we've got podcasts in the bank. We don't you know you don't know what's what Wi Fi is going to be like when you're away and that sort of thing, do you? So that's, I think we're, that's a yeah. good that, that's a good stance. I'll stand with that. I'm, yeah. I'm with James on that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. So we want it to be good, so we're not going to do it while we're away because it might be sub substandard. Excellent. Now, if you are watching on YouTube, you can see a lovely blue sky behind our guest because he is our first ever uh, German guest, and he is our first guest who is coming uh, live from Tuscany, because he's on a family holiday there. Um, and last week, actually, we had um, Keith Morlon, and he was coming live from Poland for the first time. Yeah. So we really are, um, you know, internet we're going international uh with, with, with the podcast we certainly are so uh, our guest today is and now i'm not sure if it's if it's mr sven is it riga or riga or neither riga riga one. okay mr sven riga okay. <laughs> who is who is a german guest and he is uh, we'll talk a lot about this but just to kind of tee him up a little bit before we start he is the 204th uh, person to lift the dinny stones up in uh up in scotland he's a strong first team leader he also holds the strong first elite um certification or or, or status uh he has also done sinister which we will which we'll talk about later because some of, many of you won't know what that is he's a uh, functional movements uh systems fms level one he is based i believe in stuttgart in germany um, but Correct. currently, like I said, coming from the 30 plus yeah. degrees rolling Tuscan countryside, uh, which looks very idyllic. So uh, how are you doing, Sven? Are you OK? Oh, I'm very well. Thank you very much. And um, you make me sound way more important than I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have met. I've met you, Sven, before. At, I think it was a, it was at Lillishaw in um in, in England. It and should I, have been in 2019, right? What was that there? Was that for, was it Strong Endurance or was it, it one was, of the MS ones? Was it Strong Endurance, was it? I was there as well, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. Strong Endurance and I also was there for the SFG2 with Brett Jones. Okay. Uh, so I think I, all, all I remember, I remember you were quite formidable and Pavel was getting you to do like demonstrate stuff like snatches with 40 kilos and that. But I also remember you'd have dinner at Lillishall and then you'd go down the road and have dinner down there afterwards as well because there wasn't enough food. <laughs> oh, it was not He's a it big the case that they had enough food. It was just an offer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, we are joined by, by Sven Riga, like I say, really, really... Uh, 
privileged and honored that he that he took the time because I messaged him a cut we, we set this this podcast this interview up a couple of weeks ago and then it was just I think yesterday or the day before I saw Sven on Instagram uh training you know outside on it like I say with this crisp gorgeous bright blue sky behind him and he said it's the first day of train of training on my holiday in Tuscany so I kind of thought Oh, I wonder if he's forgot. So I messaged him and said, uh, you're on holiday. Are you sure you're OK for this? And you said, yeah, looking forward to it. So, yeah, thank you very, very much for taking the time out of your holiday um, to be with us. So I suppose, Sven, to begin with, that you've done so much. You you know, like I said, I listed a few of your um, achievements uh, just in, in a little intro there. But I suppose just for, for all of us uh, listening and 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 watching maybe if you could just give us a little bit of a um a, of a history of kind of yourself your training history um you know how you got involved in strength training um you know how, there's so much to cover i mean we'll kind of obviously like we always do we'll we'll go off on a few tangents i'm sure and we'll dip in and out of, of questions as we go but do you want to kind of start wherever you want to start and tell us a bit about yourself and and and, and your background sure I mean, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I know that there were at least two people, um, Andrew Russell and Mark Valenti, who mentioned me. <laughs> so I hope I will not disappoint with, with my story because to me, it always sounds like not that really interesting. Um, honestly, like it's always the thing when you look back, you see a straight line. Mm. But But during that whole process, I actually never was sure where this might lead um, because for one thing, a lot of things just came by accident, to be honest, like the whole strength training thing. A lot of my friends um, started going to the gym when we were, we were around 17, 18 years old mm. and I was not having the money to sign up for the gym. So I took my, my father's old like plastic dumbbells filled with sand like three kilos each and started training with them um, for exercises that were too easy with just one of them. I just took both in one hand and tried it that way. And I, I liked it. I'm not sure what, what kept me going because in the beginning I was like, yeah, let's see. I'll probably do that for a few weeks or months at best. And then it will be something um, that's that will stay in my past. But But for whatever reason, I kept going for, I think, almost four years before I um, got introduced to kettlebells also again by accident mm -hmm. a friend of mine took me with him to a uh, training he was doing with with somebody who would become actually my best friend um, and he just came back from the states um, got exposed to kettlebells there he has a pretty extensive martial arts background he is a full instructor under Guru Dan in Osanto who was Bruce Lee's best friend and student and who also got training sessions with Pavel. Mm. And he saw the kettlebells there, got interested, got a kettlebell here in Germany, started training with them. I got involved into his, his little group, um, saw a kettlebell the first time, I think in October of 2010, mm. and then got my first pair of kettlebells um, in March of 2011. Enter the kettlebell. Where, can I just uh, can I just ask them when you when you were young were you because you're you, I'll I'll post that little picture up in a minute that we took with you doing the doing the double biceps. Uh, um, were were you when you were young? Uh, you know when you were six, 15, 16, 17, 18, when you first got introduced to the gym and things. Were you? What was your kind of physique or build like? Were you a skinny teenager? Were you quite a thick set and strong teenager? What what? How, what was your natural kind of body body size body body type? You know, more on the thick or stout or however you want to call it. So I was never skinny or lean in any way, mm. um, but but I was not like super huge either. Mm. So somewhere on the normal side of things, leaning more towards thick. Um, mm. But if you would see my father, you know exactly where I got um, <laughs> that from. So he. I mean, he was working his whole life physically, and I think I got that along with some other, let's say, character traits from him as well. Mm. So um, that is, yeah. Yeah. My, my natural tendency, let's say. Yeah. Okay. So did you find that you, when you did your four years of 
conventional kind of strength training, I suppose, starting with these light dumbbells and, and obviously progressing from there. But before you started with kettlebells, did you kind of, did you respond well to the training? Did you find that you were kind of strong and you got strong quite quickly and you, de you developed quite quickly over those first four years? I mean, I, I saw that I was responding very well in a, like, um, aesthetics wise, mm. like losing body fat, building muscle. I did not have a real strength focus at that time because it was like, <laughs> it was exercises I saw in men's health mm. and then doing my own little program with that. Um, basically just adding exercises whenever I liked one. So I think over the course of a few months, my training sessions took like two hours because mm. I just added exercises. I didn't cut them, mm. um, train three times a week and that felt pretty good. And then I got a book, um, which was called um, Training for Warriors by Martin Rooney. So his first MMA-based strength training book at that time. And that was my first insight into what, what strength training actually could be. So that you're not just training for, for the look, for the physique, but there's also like a performance-enhancing um, activity to that. And, and that, get, together with the kettlebell, got me started down the road that I'm currently on. Mm. So um, Pavel's entered the kettlebell, then um, starting strength by Mark Rifkin. Uh, Mark. Uh, Ripto, is it? Ripto, not Ripto. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, so I think I started training at around 2007, I think, but not before 2011 that there was any like structure or, or progression behind my training at all mm. I, I just did it because I liked it I felt good um, but like the the goal of getting stronger or actually training for a certain goal that took me way way longer mm. it's it's funny that because we were talking about this with Keith last week and just in general with like lots of people have when you're starting out you don't need to specify in anything you can just you can just dabble and, you know, so you said like for the first four years, you were just, I mean, and, and, and you were young as well. So you've got all the time yeah. ahead of you to do whatever you like. So you can just mess around and see how it goes. As long as you're not doing anything ridiculously stupid, you, you're right. going to be good, aren't you? And then you can start, then like, obviously you can start to say, right, I want to concentrate on endurance or strength or whatever, whatever it is. So that's brilliant. I think that's a, it's a good example. <laughs> I mean, I mean, looking back, I would have loved to get some 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 more structure a little bit earlier in my training, but but then again, like being able just to to see what actually works for you, what you like to do, what you're gravitating to naturally, is also I think a valuable experience for anybody to do, because mm -hmm. like we are interested in in strength training and getting stronger, but you can have so much different um. Uh, like like a different focus of your training. You don't have to be a strength athlete to to benefit from strength training. Mm. So when you first got introduced to, uh, I suppose, like you said, Pavel, enter the kettlebell. Your friend who went away and 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 learned about kettlebells maybe in America and came back. Um, what was your? When did you get involved in 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 strong first, or was it even strong first then? Was this was this when there was RKC and and that and that yeah. kind of back in the day? Yeah, yeah. That, that was still before strong first. So, hmm. like I think it was 20, 2011 when I got my first kettlebells, and then I was looking um, at the back of the the book where they advertised the the RKC certification hmm. at that time. I read about the snatch test and it was like, yeah, well, no way that I'm ever going to be able to do that. Like <laughs> the, the thoughts everybody has when they see something like that, um, when you're just starting out training with kettlebells, it just, it, it seems like a task nobody will ever be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't know what, what training will actually do for you and where you can, can get with, with just a little structure and time actually on your side. I think that's so, really good that people could for people to hear you, especially maybe people who are involved with Strong First now and kettlebells and and kind of maybe have even met you or seen you or follow you online. Um, and to see the kind of things that you do now, you know, and the kind of weights that you lift and 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 how much and how developed you are, that you know, there was a time when you looked at the that you know the 24 kilo snatch test and and thought it was impossible for you to do, you know, or saw no way that you could possibly do it. So I think that's actually a really, 
encouraging thing because most people we spoke uh, we spoke I'm either listening to a podcast or we spoke recently about it where you tend to look at, at people who are at a certain level now and assume I think maybe we did talk about to Keith about it I'm not sure where you look at people at a certain level now and you think well they've always been not at that level but you know they're they're different to me you know they're 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 somehow born with this or or naturally do it or uh, so so I think that's really encouraging and really really important for people to to understand you know there was a podcast Jocko did I think last year if I remember correctly uh with Jordan Peterson mm. and there was just one sentence he said and he was like you know it's not that I'm stronger I just did this for longer than you probably <laughs> so if I'm lifting more weight right now than than somebody else then very likely I did that for for longer than they did and all they have to to put in is a little more time as long as you are on a let's say upward trajectory and we all know that it's never going to be a straight line and there will be ups and downs but let's say the long term trend is good then all you have to do is uh, to be patient mm. just just I've got two I've got two questions yeah. you now out of that <laughs> so because the same with like kind of what James has just said I've like you know after I've met you once in person and you're a big you're a big lad right I mean you just you are you're quite tall and I, yeah and, and beefy <laughs> shall we say um <laughs> no so people might look at you and go well yeah like like James has just kind of said yeah it's easy for you because look at the look at you you know however you said doing a snatch test with a 24 would be, you know, beyond what you were capable of at the time. So the first thing is, what's what what what's the heaviest belly you've done the snatch test with? Because I'm assuming you've done it with way heavier than that um, since. Uh, 32. Even, 32, right. And that was 32. that question was for me. That's not for anyone else. I was just interested to know <laughs> as soon as you said that. Um, and I've forgotten what the second question was. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did my level one in 2016. Um, weighing a little over 100 kilo at that time. And there was not the, what then would be over 100 kilo category in the snatch test for men, right? So my first snatch test was with the 24. Then two years late, later at the SFG2, after they announced the, the new weight category, I had to do it with the 28. And I was going into that like, okay, yeah, you practice snatching with the 32 and even a few reps with the 36. So you're you're able to handle that, right? And I was completely smoked afterwards. Like mm. that was that was actually quite crushing. Um, I had to do it one year later when I did my elite um, research, and it was way easier at that time. Yeah, mm. and and that's the thing. Um, my my training basically didn't look a lot different at that time. It was just the additional time I put in. Yeah. Mm. It's funny because that's the opposite of me because I was I weighed 60. I did mine November 2014. And you had to do everything with double L's. And the weight categories were different then. I weighed 63 kilos, so I had to do everything with double 24s. Now I think it's 68 kilos is the cutoff. I so I had to so. do the snatch test with a 24 weighing 63 kilos. So now... Actually, everything's single bell and I weigh more, so it's easier for me. <laughs> You've got the other thing. <laughs> well, I know what my, I've just remembered what my second question is, and this is quite fitting because you're in Italy. And I know when Fabio last missed a training session, it was like August 1994 or something like that. He, he knows the exact date. When did you last miss a training session? Oh, um, actually, just last week. <laughs> <laughs> you're not you know too well, no, the reason why I'm asking is yeah, why, like, yeah, yeah, why, why was because that? my son's decided to get up earlier than he used to. Ah, so okay. I was just finishing my warm up and he came around the corner and it was like, okay, I guess that's it for today. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason why I asked that is because, like you said, the Jocko thing, I've just done it for longer than you and obviously you're committed. And we spoke about this before we started to record, didn't we? Because you're on holiday yep. and you've got your bells with you because you've got a goal that has just appeared. <laughs> out of it nowhere just... <laughs> yeah so yeah do you want to talk a little bit about that because you said like you know you're in it i mean I, we were saying like me and james are going away he's going down to devon or cornwall or whatever and i'm off up to the lakes but we're driving so i'm going to take my bells with me I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, james might might not yeah um, i've just put we've just I've, it's funny i've just packed the truck up and i've got a 20 a 24 
a 30 and then I've got the two kilo magnet one yeah. you know, as well. And I'm taking a mace, so I can take all that in the in the truck with me. So well, we've yeah. only got a mini, so I'm taking a twenty, a, a thirty six, and and two mag plates. But, yeah, um, two mag, yeah, yeah. But like, we'll be taking the stuff away. But that's like we're driving there. You're going, um, you're in a foreign, you're in a, a foreign country. So how did you get your bells there, and why did you take them more specifically? Because that brings us into what you what you're going to do next, right? <laughs> so my girlfriend, our son, and me, we were flying by plane here. But my girlfriend's parents actually came by car. And I convinced her father to take a few kettlebells with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because I wanted to keep a little bit of more structure training during those two weeks, uh, two and a half weeks now. Um, because I applied for another attempt to lift the Dinny Stones in October 1st. And every spot was taken until... Two weeks ago, when I was contacted by by Stevie Shanks, and he was like, "You know what? There was somebody just dropping off. We have one spot. Do you want to take it?" <laughs> and for me, it was basically a no brainer. And I said yes. yes. And afterwards, I looked at my schedule and was like, "Okay, two and a half weeks of vacation. I should be training in that time." So the decision was fairly easy for me to take the bells with me, mm. uh, especially now the luxury that. Uh, like I said, my girlfriend's father was driving by car, and so it was a little easier for me. Originally, I planned just to do some some bodyweight training here, mm. like practice more on 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 that end of things, because I just haven't done it for a while. Um, but now with that new goal on the horizon, I had to change plans a little bit, and it it was interesting when I first trained to lift the Dinny Stones, how much I actually could train with bells and um, develop strength through that um, only having a little exposure to a barbell here and now um, because I at that point started physiotherapy school quit working at the gym didn't have access to a barbell um, and most of my training was actually done with with kettlebells um, doing only a few heavy lifts here uh, once or twice a week. And that will be my, my, my plan coming back from vacation. Like, I think I have six weeks or something like that. Mm. And I haven't pulled heavy since lifting the Dinny stone. So that will be interesting. It's been two years. <laughs> that's, that's interesting though, because like you said, you know, you were planning on just doing bodyweight training while you're away, which is great. But then it's one of those things because people say, oh yeah, you can do bodyweight training and get as strong as hell. And it's like, you can, However, it won't necessarily translate over to lifting 300 odd kilos off the ground with yeah. uneven weight, having to do it Jefferson style or whatever. So that's my next question. Is, well, two questions. How easy or hard did you find it the first time? Three questions. Why do you want to do it again? And how are you going to do it? Because Andy Russell was saying there's several that you can lift them and walk. You can lift them and hold. You can lift them side by side or you can do it straddled or whatever. So... What, what's your plan? So why I'm doing it again, I cannot really tell you. It's it's like, why did I start strength training? Why did the kettlebell speak to me? Those are an, a questions I don't have an answer to you. It's just like that 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 feeling inside you. Like this I, is you, where you I know belong. exactly what you mean because I'm going to get another tattoo and it hurts. So why? But why? I'm going to do it. Right. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> why do you do the things that, that hurt you? Mm. Exactly. They give you more than you can express in words. Like, I mean, just, just, um, I think on, on Saturday, I, I watched Stoneland for the 12th, 13th time. I'm not sure. <laughs> and it, I'm still getting goosebumps just watching the intro. It's, it's something, I'm not sure. Like, those stones, there, there's a great saying in there. They're rocks to anybody walking past. But if you know the story, if you know the history, that's what makes it awesome. And I think this is, it's the same with the kettlebell. Like it's a cannonball with a handle. But if you go back in history and see what people did, how they trained with kettlebells, the, the amazing feats they did, it, it's just amazing. Hmm. And um, just for the well, listeners, Sven, just for the listeners, before we move, move past it, you mentioned the documentary Stoneland. Yeah. Um, so I think that you can find that just on YouTube, can't you? And, yes. and type right. it. So so just 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 quickly, if you don't mind, just just a quick 20 seconds, what it is, what it's about, you know, just so just so people no kind spoilers. of spoilers. 
No spoilers. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> but just so listen, people know, because, because I, want, I want people who are kind of interested in this kind of thing to maybe go and search it, you know, find it and watch it. But yeah, can you just give us a quick little, um, you know, synopsis, or if you like, you know. Um. So the late Terry Todd, um, University of Austin, I think, he and his wife, um, together with Rogue, the company from the states. Um, started doing some documentaries first on the old time strongmen mm. and then also on stone lifting in different countries. And I think the first one was actually Levantadores in the Basque country, where they have a pretty extensive history and culture around like um, not just stone lifting, but, but similar to the timber sports, like different um, events imitating the the manual labor the people in those areas would have to do on a farm for example and they turned it into a competition over time they have different stones they lift in different manners and it's just amazing to see not just how they lift them but the amount they lift like i think the record with one stone is over 300 kilograms and it's just like you, you cannot get that into your head hmm. it's just crazy and the second one they did was stoneland which took place in, in in Scotland, where they highlighted the whole like um, myth around Donald Dinney, the manhood stones that were used in the clans for for testing, like who would become a warrior, who would become actually the chief, because in a lot of clans in Scotland that the position was not claimed by birthright but by ability, mm. so you had to prove your worth to the to the clan in order to become the chieftain and and lead them. And part of that was um, a, a, I mean, the biggest part on Scott in, in Stoneland is on the Dinny Stones, actually. Hmm. And what, what Donald Dinny accomplished, like carrying them across a, a bridge, basically. So it's it's super interesting if you want to, to dive deeper into that. Have a look at the documentary. There's also a great book called Stone Lifting, um, written by Martin Yancis and Dr. Bill Crawford who are both in the documentary. Hmm. Um, and then if you really want to dive deep into the whole stone lifting thing, there's one last documentary they did in Iceland, which is called Full Sturker. Hmm. And that's one hour and 30 minutes, I think. So, Yeah, uh, I, watched, I watched the Iceland one because Full Sturker, I think it means full, 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 fully, fully strong or full strength or something. And then yeah, there's, exactly. like, there's the half... Because I'm gonna go, I'm I'm gonna go over to Iceland in November, actually. So you will, uh, yeah. So I'm gonna go and see some stuff over there. So that'll be great. But no, it's yeah. Thank you. And I mean, like we we we've had obviously um Indiana Stones. We've had David Keown on yep. the podcast as well. So I was yeah, gonna we, say we, if we're talking about books and documentaries, just he'll he'll have a few of those out too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So no, it's, it's yeah. fascinating. So so yeah. So so what was the experience like? You said you're going back to do it again. So what was the experience the first time when you went there? I've seen you, obviously, I've seen your, your lift, you know, your, your photo of, of you, of you with the, with them, with them, you know, with the wind under the Dinny stones. Um, <laughs> yeah, what was that experience like? It must've been good because you're doing it again. Oh, it, it's still hard to believe that I actually was there and did it, to be honest. Hmm. Like the, the picture is on the wall right in front of my desk. And every time I look at it, I'm like, did I really do that? I, I just, it's still hard to grasp, actually. It was an amazing experience. Um, just, how would you say? Bringing that whole process to a conclusion. Like from my decision to, yes, I'm actually going to start training for that, to the point where I went to Scotland and then also did that. Like wrapping my hand ar head around that is still... Um, something that's hard to do. And part of the reason I wanted to do it again is because I was just not happy with my lift, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, I had to switch plans in my in my training. And that goes back to your question, Peter. Um, because I had to restructure my whole training approach, um, basing it mainly on kettlebells. Hmm. I, I mean, there's a great article by, by Pavel. It's like, I think it's called Minimalist Deadlift Protocol for Quick and the Dead, something like that. You should find it on the Strong First blog, mm. where he talks about like 
the, the carryover from from kettlebell ballistics, especially if you train them like let's say the the strong endurance or A and A way or what's now become uh, kettlebell X, mm. like heavier weights for lower reps, but with a a main main focus on power and explosiveness. And he makes the point there that to get the full carryover, like the ad, uh, adaptions also of the, the sinews, of the ligaments, the tendons, you need some heavy strength training. Hmm. And the protocol he presents there is like three to five deadlift singles, fairly heavy on low volume days, which usually is like once every seven to 10 days. Hmm. And that worked just fantastically for me. Hmm. Uh, and this is the approach I will take this time as well. Uh, I don't have access to a barbell. Uh, I have my, my kettlebells at home and I do have the the, the pins, which hmm. a friend of mine did for me. I got imitation rings. I have plates. Um, so I will probably go about it the same way as before, like doing mostly high, not high rep, but, but higher volume kettlebell swings, heavy swings, one-arm swings, uh, snatches, and then supplementing that with the heavy pulls. Mm. And um, yeah, that should do the love, trick again, I hope. I like, love that this time I know what I'm what I'm going to face. This yeah. is my, my big advantage because what threw me off and which is why I was not happy with my lift was that they have, they, they have you lift these stones on um, fairly unstable mats. Mm. because in my training I was I think I lifted like almost 30 kilos more than the stones weigh so I was super confident that I would be um, making a successful attempt and when I arrived there I was the last of six guys we took turns so everybody went and they one by one they failed with the first attempt and I was like <laughs> going like okay looks like I'm going to be the first one lifting them today <laughs> and of course I didn't make it because I, I mean as I started pushing into the floor I just sank deeper and mm -hmm. that was a feeling that just threw me off and now knowing what I will have to do I think that should be like one less hurdle let's say so did everyone you had the six of you there did you you all had like an attempt if you like but and then and then did everyone go uh, you know the sort of same order again i mean did did yeah. did did anyone out of the six lift it on the first the first attempt nobody no wow well, okay no. we yeah. had like nobody on their first attempt um a guy from from uh, the states and me on the second attempt and then one more guy i think from england on the third attempt wow so th so so is that uh, what, so three of you out of the six yeah. is that right? Actually, yeah. you, you completed the lift. Wow, mm -hmm. God, That's and you've amazing. got to have you've got to have some commitment if you've flown over from the US as well to do it. You know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, this right. Is, this is yeah. what I was going to talk about. Um, number one, you said about uh, without getting trying to get political because it's not a political show, but like basically, whoever could lift the stone and prove that they were prove their worth, they could uh, they could they could lead. It's like. We should probably go back to that, but anyway. <laughs> Whoever can prove their worth can lead because it doesn't necessarily go like that, but anyway. Um, yeah, what I love about this is the specifics, like you say. So you even got a friend, because you said and, uh, Andy talked about this, and obviously you coached him, so he, he probably got it from you, but you were like, because he said one ring's like kind of round, the other one's like an oval shape, and they're, they're thinner than than your usual barbell or anything like that. So they yeah. dig it in your hands more and all of that. So you've actually gone and had some made, some replicas. And this is what I love about the like things like the Dinny Stones is people are like, like James said, you know, it's a big commitment. You fly over there, you've got to get it done. Um, It's a big expense. It's lots of training. So it's like you do everything you can to make sure that that attempt is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's brilliant because it's like, that's like the commitment is there, isn't it? And we've had your... I think you're the third person we've had on who's lifted them because we had um, Tom. I've forgotten his name. I, I mentioned him the other week as well. Tom Barber. Tom Barber, that's him. Yeah, yeah. he's lifted yeah. them, I think. And yeah. he lifted them after he was on the show, I think. And then Andrew's, Andy's done it and you've done it mm -hmm. as well. So, and how many people have done it? 200 and... 
So I was number 204, but by now I think we are at 200 and over 260, I think. Yeah, right, I think well, Andrew, Andrew Russell, I think, was about 274. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're kind of, it's probably up in the high 200s. Yeah. 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 They what released we could do an interesting is a spin off. We could do a spin off show and do 200 and odd episodes of just interviewing people who lifted the dish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that would be cool. It would be amazing. <laughs> So, Spain, I mean, sorry, you were just going to say there's an interesting stati statistic. Yeah. Are you going to say? Um, so, <laughs> they there, there's a site called liftingstones.org, and they do a newsletter. And I think two or three weeks ago, they released uh, a statistic of number of Dini stone lifts per year. So, not attempts, but successful lifts. And before 2016, it was, I think, three to five people at most. And then in 2016, Stoneland was released. And all of a sudden you had 30, 40. And I think 2022 was the year with the most successful lift, like over 50 lifts. Mm. So that documentary put a spike in there. Mm. And that's cool to see because if you watch a documentary, spoiler, <laughs> <laughs> um, the stone lifting culture was actually something that started to disappear in Scotland, even in the time of Donald Dinney. And he was one to really fighting for getting that back and revivified that. And now, like 200 years later, you have the same thing happening again. So there's a steady increase happening. And I think that's so wonderful because those traditions, those, um, those things are something that should not be forgotten. Because for one, it's what makes the culture what it actually is. Like this gives the whole character to, I think, the different cultures around the world. But then also this is something you see as a commonality throughout the world, actually. Mm. Like, like there's a guy called um, Sean Urquhart. I'm not sure if you know him. Um, he, he does a, a, a great thing on Instagram, which is called We Search Wednesday, where not every Wednesday, but pretty much once a month, he puts out some information on stone lifting uh, from from different countries around the world. And it's so interesting to see. Like, I, like I said, my, my best friend, pretty extensive background in martial arts. Um, he told me the same thing and he got me books on that, like where you say, like different countries, everywhere there's a martial arts um, evolving over the time. Although the systems look different from the outside, they're pretty much similar on the inside on what you actually do. So it's like something like, like some kind of striking, some kind of grappling or, or, or ground-based fighting, and then you have a weapons-based system. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's similar with the stone lifting, with the strength training. Like look back to ancient Greece and you find those, those huge stones with scriptures on them, like who lifted them. And, and it's just fascinating to see um, how we as a species, let's say, gravitate towards those things. And it's something that, that makes us human, I think. Like those urge to strive to, to get stronger, to get better, let's say. Um, and it's just an expression of that, I think, to me. Mm. I, think, I think it's funny because you just said about being human. <clears throat> and for me, being like that's more of the animal side at lifting it in my head and the being human thing is trying to understand why when it doesn't matter you just you just go and do it and it makes you feel good it's like it doesn't matter why mm -hmm. <laughs> you just yeah. carry on doing it you know i was I, I, gonna I, ask you probably answered this already but i was gonna because david has obviously gone around um island uncovering all these stones so you were saying the uh, um, since since Stoneland, because he said he watched Stoneland over um, lockdown, didn't he? And then he got into Stone mm -hmm. Lifting Garden because yep. the gym was shut. So, like, um, obviously the um, popularity of it has gone up. And then he's gone around Ireland and found all these stones because yeah. he was like, well, there aren't any on the, on the map. I think it's on that site that you mentioned. They've got a map of the stones of the world, haven't they? Yeah, exactly. And he's just been adding to Ireland, like, all over the place. So what would the equivalent be in Germany? Is there a stone? Was there a stone lifting culture, or, or is there an equivalent kind of thing? So, there is no real um, history on that. To be honest, I was talking with Sean about that. Um, there is one story of a duke, actually from the state where I'm from, 
who supposedly lifted a big black stone of, I think, 182 kilograms. Mm -hmm. And you can find it in Munich. It still lies there in um, the old castle. It, it's not liftable. It's chained, actually. And mm -hmm. I think nobody would be able to lift it. Mm -hmm. um, but besides that, you don't really find stories on that. So he had a trace um, going back to the farmers. But but I couldn't find anything on that um, specifically. Like I was actually going around talking to, to farmers in our area and they would not know uh, about those stones. It, it was something like 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 basically a stone that would mark a place where they would hold court or something like that mm. so um the vikings did something similar they had their meetings at a certain place um where matters was matters were talked over that would um like be important for the whole clan decisions would be made made uh, on how to go about certain boundaries, let's say, with your neighbors, things like that. And apparently there was something similar in, in Germany concerning the farmers. But you, you cannot find any, like, written documents on that those stones would actually be lifted. If you look, like, at countries around Germany, you find those similar traditions, though. Like, testing stones to be, be to get a job on a farm, you have um, like throwing contests in Switzerland, for example. So I guess there was something like that at one point. It probably got forgotten over time. So mm. that is my guess at the moment. I'm going to put this out there, and I apologize to you, Sven, if this ruins your life in, in the future because you get too busy. But David said the same in Ireland, and then yeah, he just started to pull, mm -hmm. at the, pull at the thread, and then people started getting in touch with him. And then all of a sudden he was meeting 90 year old guys in a village somewhere who were like, oh yeah, my grandfather lifted that stone back mm -hmm. in the day. So it was still only just yeah. within living memory. So I'm just putting that out there. So if there's any listeners- It would be wonderful. Want to send Sven any messages about lifting yeah. stones in Germany, get involved. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> earlier this year, we went on a little vacation with our son to Bavaria, to an old farm. They reconstructed and turned into like a family um, vacation um, location. And driving there, we came by so many farms and I was scouting like, okay, this could be a stone to lift, like <laughs> using the description um, David actually used. Like, yeah, you find those stones, let's say in the center of a village, sometimes under a big tree. And I was, I was really scouting the area for that, but I did not have the time to go to those places and actually ask the people. That would have been cool. Did you, um, say, did you say this was on a vacation earlier this year? Yeah. So this is your, so you've got, you're going all these vacations, you've got time. <laughs> um, as you see, since officially I'm at school and ah. I have school holiday. <laughs> That's all the time you need then. Excellent. Exactly. <laughs> so like, Sven, it's, can I ask you Sven, just, just as uh, to, to kind of, you know, kind of make this applicable for you and for, for others as well. You've mentioned a couple of times now, you've got a son. And yeah. how, how old is your son? He's, he's, he's very little at the moment, isn't he? Yeah, one and a half years. One and a half years, okay. So what, <laughs> I, was gonna, what I was gonna ask was, how has how was that um, kind of changed your your life and your your time for training? Or you, because you already mentioned, you missed the training session last week yeah. because you know, your son woke up and then it's time to spend time with him and things. So um, has it has it been a challenge to keep training or have you changed your training or have you restructured it or have you had to kind of change the way you view training and the way you fit it in? I mean, how's because this is obviously something that most mm -hmm. people at some stage will go through, um, either through, you know, having children or maybe a change in commitments with work and that kind of thing. So how has that kind of impacted you? Oh, in all the ways you just mentioned <laughs> okay. Okay. So, <laughs> he, he's also an early riser mm. <laughs> yeah, i think he got that from me okay um so i always i always trained uh in the morning before leaving for school or leaving for work um but so one thing was i had to move my training even earlier in the day 
so not during the next two weeks but, <laughs> uh, on every other day during the week i get up at three in the morning um wow okay. take a shower get some coffee read a little bit do a little work and then i train for up to an hour let's put it that way so starting at five quarter past five something like that and then it, it could happen that he decides to get up at half past five hmm. and then that was my training for the day basically hmm. so what, what i realized at one point was right now is not the time for to follow any like set in stone structured program with any linear progression or anything like that hmm. um i'm not going a hundred percent intuitively as well so for for me what works best at the moment is having some guidelines a framework with in which i'm able to move fairly freely let's say hmm. so things like easy strength or um what what turned into Pavel New's book Kettlebell X, mm. like the the anti glycolytic training, um, those things work very well at the moment for me. The thing I realized as well was like, <laughs> it come it came as a surprise to me, although it's pretty obvious. Brett Jones likes to talk about that. Um, you have to keep an eye on your recovery. And if your life stress increases over time, your training stress, let's say, cannot increase at the same time. Hmm. So so I realized at one point that I need to cut back on, on, on training a little more than I would like to, to make it nevertheless um, effective and giving me the results I want to do. Like it's it's those one of these situations where doing less will actually give you more, because you would not be able to recover from from more. This is really interesting because I know that when we spoke to Andrew, it's a slightly different because he does like shift work and he yeah. was talking about programming his training, but that's not kind of like a surprise as such. He'll know you know a week, two weeks, three weeks in advance what his shifts are, and then he can program it. Whereas with a child, it's a lot more ad hoc, and things can change you know day to day, or you know, like you say, one day they might just wake up early, and then your your training has yeah. to change. And then the other person we spoke to recently was Lucy Underdown, who we mentioned, you know, is one of the strongest, well, is the strongest female deadlifter in the world. And she's a full-time police officer. And she was talking as well about having to change her training and actually reduce the number of sessions per week. Yeah. I think originally from five down to three, um, because that was causing stress with a mm -hmm. stressful job and not sleeping properly and then trying to do five heavy sessions. So now it's really interesting that over the last probably month where there's been, there's been three of you who've kind of said similar things you know, albeit slightly differently in slightly different circumstances. Um, so, but because I see people at my, at my gym and I'm sure you see people and Pete sees people who, you know, they might be going through very, very stressful times, but they're yep. trying to hammer themselves or they're trying to, you know, they're going for a stressful time in life, but they, and then they want to lump on more stress with training or have some massive physical goal. And um, I think when you're training for a lifelong pursuit, like, like all three of us are, um, yep you can accept that, okay, well, maybe the next six months to 12 months is a time to more tick over and just be a bit more fluid with training and not jump into something massive like, you know, 18 month old child and that sort of thing. So no, it's really yeah. important for people to understand that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, because I've, it I've was just interesting. Sorry, carry on. Sorry. Just, just a quick thought. Yeah. It was interesting what, what you mentioned that Lucy did. So she cut, back from five to three training sessions but kept them fairly heavy right mm. so i stayed with my five sessions from monday through friday but i cut down on the length of the session mm. because i felt with getting up that early i actually needed that little push in the morning to keep me going mm. um it's something jeff nooper talked a few years ago like the training should actually provide you the energy to keep going and at first was I was like, well, usually I feel a little bit more tired after training than before. But 
that really made me understand what he was trying to get at because like it's the same i'm not sure where it came from i'm not sure if it originated with with pavel but like feeling better after the training session than before hmm. that made me understand that so now i actually look forward to my training every morning because i know with the training done i will have an easier time um let's say being energized throughout my day Hmm. not having that that sluggish phases throughout the afternoon um yes i will go to bed fairly early because i have to rise in the morning fairly early as well i was going to ask actually if you're waking up at 3 a.m what time what time do you tend to be in in bed by nine nine p.m in the morning in the evening yeah sometimes yeah. it works better sometimes not so much but but usually around that time yeah excellent because yeah i've been listening to a, a thing with robin sharma recently who 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 wrote a book years ago, I read it called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. He's kind of like a self-help kind of guy. But then he wrote at the 5 a.m. club and he was just talking about he wakes up at four and like you said, does some reading, gets some coffee and then does some exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and it feel, but he goes to bed early. But he sort of said that and it is true at that time of the morning when you're up early. The world is a very peaceful place, isn't it? It's yes. a different kind of place. And you can do what you want to do without distraction and, you know, without lots of people calling upon you because yeah. most other people are in bed. <laughs> so so it's, just, it's interesting. Yeah, what are you going to say, Pete? I've just thought of Dan John there. It's like, you're going to get up at five. Right, I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to get up at 4.30. Well, I'm going yeah. to be better than you. I'm going to get up at four. Right, well, I'm going to get up at yeah. Like yeah. the four Yorkshiremen. Like, I got up before I went to bed. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm better than yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say, there's probably a name for it, but it's it, what you've just described is kind of semi-intuitive training. So you yeah. said you wouldn't, you're not going fully intuitive training, whatever that means, but you're also not fully structured as well. You've got wiggle room in your training mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle, which is what most people will need. Because I mean, for me, I've got a, a, a spaniel and it's 30 degrees over here. So we have to go out for a walk in the morning yeah. where usually I take him out in the afternoon for three hours and he gets plenty of time then but I'll train in the morning. But if I, tr if I don't train in the morning and then it's 30 degrees in the afternoon, I'm, I hate it. And I end up doing like 50% of my program. Yeah. Um, but doing a hundred percent of my program it, I'm, is going to take away from my life. Doing 50% yeah. of it isn't going to it, like stall the progress basically. Cause it's mm. just cause I'm, I'm too hot cause I'm rubbish with the heat. So Yeah. That's kind of that's that's how I look at it is um, semi intuitive. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not just going to go with what I'm going to. I'm going to stick to the program, but I'm just going to take it back a little bit because I don't want to hurt myself, basically. So I want to exactly. enjoy it. So, yeah, and it should, that. like you say, it shouldn't take away from the rest of your life. Like yeah, there are other responsibilities you have. Hmm. Well, and, I, don't, um... I don't, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, Sven, this has been amazing and we haven't even really touched on lots of stuff. So I think what we'll have to say is we will have you back on again in the near future, if that's OK. When it you're... would be a pleasure. When next, you're not, when next you're time not he's on holiday, holiday. <laughs> <laughs> which will be in about three weeks. <laughs> Maybe you can, uh, yeah, oh, you can. We could do a live one well. from. Uh, we'll do a live one from Scotland. When yeah, you're yeah. In the Diddies in in October. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? We could do that. Yeah. Because there's just some one one other cool thing that's going to happen, which I didn't tell you now. Um, but Martin Yancis, the Stone Man. Yeah. Right. I, I contacted him again, and he will actually. Uh, meet me two days before my attempt at the, the Dinny Stones to to help me with my attempt to lift the Inverse Stone as well. The Inverse Stone, okay. So yeah. can you explain to 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 us and our listeners what that is, please? So so th that is basically, I think, the second most famous stone in Scotland, and I would say worldwide. Like in in Scotland, the Dinny Stones, the Inverse Stone, and then. We mentioned Iceland. There's the Husafell stone. Mm. So those three usually are the top three um, most people know about in, in um, yeah, let's say the world of strength training. The mm. inverse stone is basically like almost a sphere, a little more on the oval side of things, I think. Um, it's the origin, let's say, of the Atlas stone. 
Mm. So it was Inverse Stone, then those McLashen Stones, and then the Atlas Stones. Like in, in the book Stone Lifting, um, there's a great article by David Webster who talks about the origin of the Inverse Stone. Actually, Donald Dinney is involved in that as well. Hmm. Like Donald Dinney's first name became Donald because a guy named Donald lifted the the Inverse Stone with such an ease that his father was so impressed because Donald's father was the only one who could do that at this time that he named his son after that guy. So it's a cool story. Yeah. Um, and it, it weighs 120 kilos, I think. It's 265 pounds. Hmm. And um, so either you lift it on um, a plinth or what I would like to do is getting it on my shoulder. And um, I, I tried that two years ago as well. Did not really prepare for, for that. Just gave it a try. And it was way harder than expected. So I got it on my lap, but but I couldn't stand up with it, sadly. <laughs> so this time, I hope I'm a little better prepared for that. And it's also a cool uh, chance to meet Martin. He He's an amazing guy. He he. When I asked him if he would have time to meet up, he was like, yeah, sure. Let me know which day and time would work for you and I'll make it happen. So um, it, it's that community thing again. And also he is... Like, like I said, one of the guys who who's responsible for the the growing popularity of stone lifting in 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 Scotland, he's one of the main figures in the Stoneland documentary. So it would be wonderful to 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 meet him. I'm definitely going to be watching the Stoneland documentary again. I watched it quite a long time ago, but now that I'm on, I'm going to be on holiday for two weeks. <laughs> oh, you I'll, have to. I'll definitely watch that. That's brilliant. No, well, that sounds like a plan then. If we if we catch up with you again, maybe kind of October time, yeah. uh, we'll stay in touch, obviously. But it'd be great to talk to you after the next one and hear how you do with the, with the Inverstone. That's going to be that's going to be incredible. Um, Oh, that was a great, that's a great conversation, Pete, isn't it? I can tell Pete's smiling. He loves it. I love the stories. I didn't know Donald did. It was called Donald because of this guy who lifted the, I love that. Yeah. That's amazing. It's that, brilliant. That's the thing. If you, if you start to, to dive into the story behind those things, it's just so amazing how rich it actually is. Mm. Yeah, it's embedded, isn't it? It's, it's woven into the, the culture. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I love it. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. And you mentioned it, but hope for, well, I will be in, in November. I'll go to Husafel and see yeah. the, um, the, you know, that's one of the events they'll be doing there, the, the Husafel uh, stones. So uh, that's about I, I 100 will and, keep a close 100. eye on your profile. So that will be, because, <laughs> and I, I did not tell anybody about this until now, but Rogue sells the Full Sturker t-shirt, right? Just a black t-shirt with Full Sturker on it. Okay. And I got that. And it's on the wall in front of me. Yeah. Because this is my big goal. So lifting the Husafell stone in Iceland, walking the full yeah. round yeah. Um, around the sheep pen. And I'm not going to wear that t-shirt until I did that. Oh, so this wow. is the big long-term goal for me <laughs> at the moment. Oh, that's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. Oh, Sven, it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has. And like I say, you you, you sat there in gorgeous Tuscan country. So oh, God, look at that. <laughs> Listen to that. <laughs> I'm that very lucky. A, you are very, like, that's amazing. Yeah. There's a tree over there. Yeah. Two days ago, I took a walk with, with Liam. Yeah. Because he was just too tired. And he fell asleep. And it was like, you know what? That's the perfect place for a nap. So I just lay down, uh, leaning against the tree, and we took a nap of an hour, I think. So. Uh... Yeah, yeah that, that was just pulled down. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying some nice wine and things over there as well. Oh, you have yeah. no idea. Yeah. Like the meat here, <laughs> the prices, it's so cheap compared to Germany, you would not believe. Wow. Wow. And you were there for two and a half weeks, yeah? Yeah. Beautiful. It's, it's my last big school vacation, so I have to take opportunity of that. Yeah. So when I come home, I will be time to start preparing for the final exams which will be in march next year okay so <laughs> that oh, will dude. be an interesting time getting all those things um uh, let's say arranged in my day mm. 
Oh, well, yeah. I mean, if, if, if people, I mentioned the videos of you training out there, if people want to uh, follow you, because obviously I'm sure they will now, you're talking about all the things you've got coming up and your training and things. What's the, what, what platform are you most active on? Is it Instagram? Is that a good place yeah. for people to go? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's the auto share function on Facebook, so you can still find most of the things there as well. Yeah. Um, but the way it just developed over the last two years, uh, Instagram became the main platform for me. Excellent. So that's Sven, S V E N underscore Riga, R I E G E R on Instagram. And like I say, he's got a great Instagram feed and, uh, and you can see loads of good training and, and, and photos and things on there, which are really inspiring. And especially I'm sure we'll see, uh, you know, we'll talk again, obviously, like I say, later this year, um, with you, but if people want to go and uh, highly recommend them, uh, give you a follow on there. And we, yeah, we, we haven't touched really upon, you know, the strong first elite, the city <laughs> star, you know, the team leader stuff you're doing, but, but it's been, it's been great what we have talked about. And I'm sure, like I say, we'll, we'll get you on again later in the year and have an, and have another really good conversation, but thank you so much, Sven. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Um, <laughs> hard to believe that this is already an hour passing by. So. I know, I know it's been great. And uh, I tell you what, I will actually, Pete, I'm going to read that review that I needed to read. Yeah. Cause I'm, yes. I'm like going to pass on to another, um, let me just right. This is on the on the on the uh, on the fly here. Um, Health oddity. Let me just find it here. We have had a few new reviews come in, but the one that I'm going to read quickly now. It's written about episode two hundred and one, which is what's what's changed in the last twenty five years, and uh, this is from Ryan Jones, and he said found this podcast really interesting and puts a lot um, and puts a lot of how everyday habits have in general changed over the last 25 years into perspective, especially how junk food, targeted marketing and technology has enabled a more obese and lazy culture. So that was specifically around um, one podcast. That's Ryan Jones, Ryan J80. So Ryan, if you want to message me um, and let us know which t-shirt size and color you would like, and then we'll get that for you uh, ASAP. Okay. So like we said, we are trying to get reviews on Apple podcasts. Uh, we are getting more and more reviews on there, which is great. And if you write a review, we will read the review out and then we will send you out some health oddity merchandise. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Pete, for today. Uh, that's perfectly all right. I was, I was going to be here anyway. <laughs> but thank you to Sven. Thank you for, Sven, pleasure, guys. for joining thank you very us from much. Tuscany. Absolutely brilliant. And thank you to all of you for listening. We will be back um next week with episode 209 that will be post holiday for pete and myself so we'll have plenty to talk about so as well by, uh, that will be even more pronounced <laughs> <laughs> pete, well, what's, what's you get rid of that? you don't you don't it's it's, it's, with, it's with me forever <laughs> oh, so we'll be back next week so yeah thank you so much guys we're not sure we have got guests lined up i'm not sure who the guest at 209 will be um or if it might just be me and pete but yeah thank you sven will be back with us later in the year uh which we're looking forward to thank you all for listening and like i say health oddity uh on apple podcasts if you can do reviews for us on there and also a shout out again to give us a subscribe on YouTube if you don't already, because we're getting a, quite a bit of traction on there as well, which is great. So until next time, bye-bye. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype-free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.